I was hoping to keep going so I wouldn't have to preach. <laughs> All of a sudden I hit that part and I was like, oh, now I'm on. <clears throat> We've been going through the book of Genesis in a series called An Eternal Family Life. And we heard at the beginning of the series how vital Genesis is because God lays down the foundation blocks to our faith. If you miss Genesis, the Old Testament will only be law to you. And you miss the meaning if you miss the Old Testament, your life of faith will have diminished power. Jesus said that the scriptures point to him. Therefore, the books of the Old Testament are crucial to fully knowing Jesus Christ. You must, learn, you must also learn your place within the family and to love the things that God loves. Therefore, we must look into these stories, not just read them to understand their importance, as well as to pull out of them what's needed for our own faith development. So let's start by reviewing where we've been. At the start of the Abraham story, we saw that God was narrowing the scope of his work to this one man and his barren wife to produce the offspring of God's eternal family. By using the couple, God was demonstrating his power. The birth of Isaac set the record straight. The only explanation for Isaac is God himself. Isaac is truly a miracle child. Next, we saw in the sacrifice of Isaac, the provision of God that God didn't perform a single miracle through the birth of Isaac. God is working through this family to accomplish a much larger plan by preserving it. While the story of, with the story of Rebecca, Isaac's wife, we find the providential work of God. But what also begins to emerge is a new pattern, which is the, that we too play a role in the unfolding uh, work of God. Like what cement this new way of following God has to be laid into its form and to be given time to harden. With the miraculous birth and mysterious redemption of Isaac, God showed himself true to his word in the big events which only a God could do. The question now is, to what extent will this God be involved in the smaller details of his children's lives? Does he really care for questions about how we live and who we live with? The answer is yes. And the pattern for us to follow is that of waiting. And the work that we are to do is to believe by trusting in God. Now, if we put these three aspects together, power, provision, and providence, we see a commonality that's very similar to all religions. In fact, we would characterize this as a way of, uh, as a religious life. The pattern and work in a religious life, however, is to be good and to do good in order to gain reward. While that's, not, while that's not what we've been seeing in the life of those who walk with God and thus far with Abraham, we want to see how very closely these two ways of life are from a human perspective. The covenant God of Abraham will demand faith and trust and acts of obedience. The norms and behaviors of the people of the Bible look very similar to all other major religions of the world from a human perspective. And yet, as we will see in the story of Jacob, while the forms look familiar, the approach to this God of Abraham is radically different and therefore will bring with it a radically different outcomes for those who get it. Grace precedes obedience in the life of those who live for God. So as we turn now to the story of Jacob, we will see that this God is now going to accelerate the progeny or growth of his family through Jacob's offspring. Progeny, that's my P word, okay? as best I could do. It will soon be this family and ultimately the people from this family that will become a nation which God will continue his work to build his eternal family. While we see human biological growth in the narrative, we also, more importantly, are going to see a kind of inward growth starting to develop within its members. We need to focus on this change because it will not only become the key to understand this transformation process, but also to receiving the power to follow this God through the pain and hardship of life. What God intends for good will be a slow, progressive, life-learning process in this family and ultimately in the nation of Israel. In fact, it will ultimately be either the rising or falling of every person on the face of the earth. Last week we saw that there seems to be a regression in the, fa in the faith of Isaac's household. The family seems to be degenerating, not improving in its moral framework. This is important and curious at the same time. Why isn't this family getting more devout, more distinguishable from the families around them? 
At the same time, this family is blessed and growing. And isn't that what the promise of Abraham declared? So there's a mystery happening here. And that is that the influence directing everything in the life of this family seems to be coming from outside the family, while at the same time working on the inside of the family. The mystery is that this influence seems to have a life of its own, and it's not respondent to the behavior of the family. So what is it, and what's going on? To answer this, we will be examining the promise that we have been talking about since the story of Abraham. The promise is God's plan for rescuing humanity, and ultimately, it's the blueprint by which a Savior will reconcile back to God the children of God. It operates in a way, however, that serves as the cornerstone to all relationships in the world. God to us, us to God, and us to each other. In the New Testament, we call it the gospel. So let's unpack the story of Jacob by understanding three things the promise teaches us in the story. We'll look at the nature of the promise, then the work of the promise, and lastly, we'll look at heaven's true gate. Let me read from the book of Genesis, chapter 28. First, so Abraham, uh, Jacob's life is characterized by two bookends, two bookend events where uh, he meets God. And that's what we'll focus on today in uh, our two readings. The chapters 28 through 35 that Isaac gave me, <laughs> it's a lot. Uh, and there's a tremendous amount of good, good stuff in those chapters. I really encourage you this week, maybe include that in your morning time. Uh, just very human and, and wonderful stories, but we can't obviously read everything and we can't go through all the great points here. I wish we could, but that's just not possible. So I'm going to read uh, chapter 28, verses 10 through 22. I think it's up on your screen here. Jacob left Beersheba and went toward Haran. Uh, you remember from last week that uh, Jacob stole the blessing from his brother Esau, and that wasn't a good thing. And so uh, Esau wants to kill Jacob, and in, to the extent where the family believes that he wants to kill Jacob. Uh, and so uh, mom has to get Jacob out of the house. So like any good woman, she convinces her husband what the best idea is to do. And so Jacob declares what's, uh, so Isaac declares what's the best idea, which is that Jacob should go to uh, the land of his people in Mesopotamia and find a wife. And he blesses Jacob, there confirming publicly that Jacob is the inheritor of the blessing. So it's a really incredible move on, on Rebecca's part. But sadly, she has to lose her son, Jacob. So Jacob's on the run. He's the inheritor. He's the, the one with the promise, and yet he's a fugitive. <clears throat> so we find Jacob uh, really at his first night here. Jacob left Beersheba, that's where the family was living, and went toward Haran. And he came to a certain place and stayed there that night because the sun had set. Taking one of the stones of the place, he put it under his head and lay down, lay down in that place to sleep. And he dreamed, and behold, there was a ladder set up on the earth. And the top of it reached to heaven, and behold, the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. And behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord, the God of Abraham, your father, and the God of Isaac. The land on which you lie, I will give to you and to your offspring. Your offspring shall be like dust of the earth, and you shall spread abroad to the west and to the east, to the north and to the south. And in you and your offspring shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Behold, I am with you and will keep you wherever you go, and I will bring you back to this land, for I will not leave you until I have done for you what I promised." Then Jacob awoke from his sleep and said, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I did not know it. And he was afraid and said, How awesome is this place. This is none, either, none other than the house of God, and this is the gate of heaven. So early in the morning, Jacob took the stone that he had put under his head and set it up for a pillar and poured oil on top of it. He called the name of the place Bethel, but the name of the city was Luz at the first then Jacob made a vow, saying, If God will be with me and will keep me in this way that I go and will give me bread to eat and clothing to wear so that I come again to my father's house in peace, then the Lord shall be my God. And this stone which I have set up for a pillar shall be God's house, and all that you give me I will give a full tenth to you. So in this story we see Jacob in a very vulnerable place. Literally, the place where he is is stated six times. It's in the middle of nowhere. 
Not only that, but he is penniless, homeless, and alone. Jacob has an awesome dream that night, and in it he sees a vision of a ladder or a staircase that goes from Jacob up to heaven, and standing on the staircase is the Lord, who pronounces to Jacob the same promises he gave to his father Isaac and his grandfather Abraham. So let's look at how the promise functions in this story. First, we see that the promise comes to us from the outside. It's not something that we achieve. In fact, Jacob's not only in a pathetic state having culturally disgraced his father and stolen his brother's inheritance, but because he's such a deceiver, God puts him to sleep to keep him from trying to spin and control the situation. We see that the promise is also a gift. It's sheer grace. God sees Jacob's vulnerability steeped in deceit and running for his life. Jacob is an anti-hero, making the gift that much more unmerited. Three, we see the promise work through the weakness and the vulnerability of Jacob. Jacob, as we said, is in the middle of nowhere and God shows up. Further, God is attracted to Jacob because he is vulnerable and weak. As we read in the psalm earlier, David pleads for mercy from God because of his sin. David is hopeless and knows that unless God is willing to accept David as a sinner, then David has no hope. Jacob is not at that place, but he will eventually come to realize the depth of God's love and his commitment to Jacob despite his deceitful behavior. Fourth, it meets us where we are. Look again at Jacob. How is he feeling? He is alone and he's afraid. He is poor and homeless and therefore completely vulnerable. What does God say to him through the promise? Behold, I am with you and will keep you wherever you go. And I will bring you back to this land for I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. Just importantly is what does God not say? Well, 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 what have we here? Looks like life is finally catching up with you, huh, Jacob? You made your own bed, now you can lie on it until you can demonstrate some respect for your family and for me, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Now look at Jacob's response to this glorious promise. If God will keep me, if God will be with me and keep me in this way that I go, and I will get, get bread to eat and clothing to wear so that I come again to my Father's peace, then God will be my God. What's he doing? He's bargaining with God. He's going right back into his default mode of evaluating relationships from his vantage point. This way of negotiation is indicative of religious behavior. Look again at the two approaches here. Look how lovingly and tenderly God meets Jacob. He takes great care in not only how he comes to him, but also in what he says to him. There's nothing but concern and affection for Jacob. Now look at Jacob. His best response is to recount all that pertains to him personally. He completely bypasses the grand vision of being progenitor of all the blessed families of the earth. So here's the first lesson to be learned by the nature of the promise. We are not fit to receive it. We can't handle it. The very nature of it is so beyond our capacity to openly receive its unfiltered and penetrating love. We just don't have relationships like this in our lives. And so when the pure grace of God comes to us, we don't know how to respond. And we almost always get it wrong, especially at first. We have to grow into that knowledge and to grasp the extent of its true implications, not only for ourselves, but for the world. And now here's the second we see, that we, are, uh, that we have to be made fit. How is God going to get Jacob to the place where Jacob himself reverses the order of priority with respect to the kindness and grace of God through what he has just promised? How is he going to get Jacob to see the first, that the first things are the first things and the second things are the second things? And the order actually matters if you think about it. So to summarize, we see that the nature of the promise is that it comes to us from outside. We cannot conjure up its provisions through our own moral performance. In fact, it seems to come in weakness and to those who are most vulnerable. Regardless of how it does come, however, we are not worthy of it. So it is a gift. We are not fit to receive it, but God gives it to us because we could not only because we could not receive it in any other way. We do not receive it, we have to grow into it. 
to be made fit to have it work in our lives. And so this leads to the second major point, which is the work of the promise. So let's see how that work uh, comes to fruition by looking at the second story, which is from Genesis chapter 32. So Jacob's lived a, a pretty complex, well, pretty dysfunctional life <laughs> with his uncle Laban. He's now got uh, two wives, two concubines, and 11 kids. Uh, as he heads back uh, to things, uh, his father-in-law uh, never wanted him to leave and, and was hunting him, and things just went very, very bad. You, you'll, you'll really enjoy it uh, if you read it. <laughs> Uh, so Jacob has a problem. He's got Laban to his backside, and he's got Esau coming at him from the front side. He's hemmed in. He can go nowhere. Uh, but he's got to deal with the situation of moving forward in his life. And so he does everything he can, anticipating and not knowing whether Esau is going to kill him or not, 20 years later now. And so he does everything he can. And when he finally settles uh, everything um, uh, and does the best he can to prepare for meeting uh, Esau, he goes uh, and gets rid of everybody, and he's by himself the night before he's to meet Esau. So I pick up the story in Genesis 32, uh, beginning in verse, uh, Genesis chapter 32, beginning in verse 22. The same night he arose and took his two wives, his two female servants, and his 11 children, and crossed the ford of the Jabbok. He took them and sent them across the stream and everything else that he had. And Jacob was left alone. And a man wrestled with him until the, uh, until the breaking of the day. When the man saw that he did not prevail against Jacob, he touched his hip socket. And Jacob's hip was put out of joint as he wrestled with him. Then he said, let me go, for the day has broken. But Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. And he said to him, what is your name? And he said, Jacob. Then he said, your name shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel. For you have striven with God and with men and have prevailed. Then Jacob asked him, please tell me your name. But he said, why is it that you're asking my name? And there he blessed him. So Jacob called the name of the place Peniel, saying, for I have seen God face to face, and yet my life has been delivered. The sun rose upon him as he passed Peniel, limping because of his hip. And I think that's where we said, okay, yeah. So the work of the promise. Going back to his dream, Jacob sees, going back to the dream from the first reading that I just read, Jacob sees the angels of God ascending and descending the staircase, as you remember. Jacob is the central focus of the promise now, and all the concentration of heaven is on the working out of the promise in Jacob's life. Jesus, in the Gospel of Mark, makes the point that God is always at work, and his central focus is the salvation of mankind. Everything points to the work of Jesus Christ in the salvation of mankind. This was the work from the beginning of creation. The writer of Hebrews makes that point when he says the lamb, that is Jesus Christ, was slain before the foundation of the world. So everything since the time that God set his mind to create an earthly family has been set in motion around the implications and effects of this great work of redemption and is still going on until one day heaven and earth will be reunited again. So for Jacob, the promise has an enormous effect on his life over time, especially as he sees the pieces of the promise coming true. He's no longer poor, he's no longer alone, and he's no longer isolated without family or afraid. This then is the first mark of the promise, which is the fulfilling of its content to strengthen us in our faith. Let me say that again. The first mark of the promise or the work of the promise is to strengthen us in our faith by fulfilling what God promises for us. As he does that, we begin to trust in him and to believe. If the work of God is to make us fit because we are unfit, we see here in the promise that the promise brings Jacob to a place where he's fit to be tied. And this is the second mark of the promise's work, which is to soften us up for God to change us. It breaks us down for the work of God in our life. Jake, Jacob is too unawares to think about what's happening here, so he does what little he can to try and outmaneuver the worst-case scenarios before the next day. Yet at the end of it all, as Jacob crosses back into the promised land, he is once again alone, vulnerable, and afraid, just like when he left. When the shadowy figure of a man appears and meets with Jacob, Jacob is, no, is, is in no mood to, to ask questions. 
He grasps his enemy and does what he does best. He wrestles. Though at first Jacob is able to match the man's strength for strength, when Jacob refuses to let the man go at daybreak, the man simply touches Jacob's hip socket and wrenches his hip out of place. It is at this point that Jacob realizes who he is fighting against. It's God. Jacob's whole perspective in life has been wrong. God has graciously spared Jacob, though he could easily have put him to death. His life was spared, though he deserved death. And this restraint of power and act of mercy by God causes the very foundations of Jacob's life to crumble. He's no longer the same spiritually or physically. God has been faithful all along, not an enemy. Tim Keller says that this change in a person's life by the work of God from trusting themselves to trusting God, that God almost always has to wound you to show you this, which is a sign of grace. Paul, in his letter to the Corinthians, shares his own struggle of how he prayed to God earnestly three times to be rid of a thorn in his flesh, only to have God show him that it was not a problem to be solved or an obstacle to be overcome, but it was a true strength for his faith and trust in God. It was a sign of grace. It would, it would outwardly manifest itself as a handicap like a perpetual limp, but inwardly it was growing the apostle from glory to glory. Just one second here. Whew. The Jewish scholar Robert Alter in his commentary on Genesis makes a more immediate life application regarding this change, which is that he who acts crookedly is bent, permanently lamed by his nameless adversary in order to be made straight before his reunion with Esau. And one last commentator wrote, by his wrestling with God, Jacob entered upon a new stage in life. Do you walk with a limp? And lastly, let's look at heaven's gate. Jacob announces after his dream of Bethel that this place is where heaven and earth meet. It's the gate of God. Centuries later, Jesus will make a reference to Nathanael that he will see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. We've come full circle. Full circle. I said at the beginning that the fundamental difference between, the faith in the, between faith in the Bible and religious approach to God is that those who trust in the promises of God recognize over time the uselessness of moral behavior before a holy God as a means to advance gain. With religion, the worshiper approaches God by climbing the staircase to obtain salvation. But the gospel teaches us that salvation comes to us and does so freely. It's not cheap. It comes at a great cost, which is the life of the Son of God who has done the work on our behalf. When Christ says that the angels of God are ascending and descending, he means that literally. He is the stairwell, stairway himself. He was the one to... To live, perfectly, to live a perfectly obedient life. He never once wrestled against men or contended against God, and yet it was the will of God to crush him for our sake. He never lied, and in his mouth was no deceit. When he was reviled, he did not shoot back, though he was always in the right. Jacob complained that his wages were changed 10 times over the course of 20 years. Jesus was betrayed by a friend and at his arrest. And in his moment of being poor, alone, and abandoned, all his friends left him. When he pleaded with God to be released from the horror that awaited him, he received no blessing and no word from the Father. Where Jacob received grace, Jesus got silence and received hell in return for his obedience. This is our amazing grace. This is the wonderful outflow of the work of God through his promise to redeem us and bring us back to himself, to save us because of our sin. Because we are poor and helpless, Jesus Christ becomes poor and utterly vulnerable on our behalf so that we might obtain his riches as sons and daughters of God. Let's pray. Well, Father, we thank you that you are a promise-keeping God. And we thank you for the promise of your power to do what you say that you will do. And also to keep us along the way. In the entire process from start to finish, all comes from you. Each of us who believe and have faith that you will make us your children are miracle children. We have all been rescued from darkness and brought into your kingdom of light through the power and the grace and the work of, of 
of yourself through Jesus Christ. We give thanks to you for these great stories and want to take in the importance of them by building upon them true faith, which will teach us to trust more and more on you, to wait on you, and while we work, to believe and to trust in you. And so we commit these things to you, seeing them as important for our own lives, and asking you to help, help us along the way. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.